This is the story of how one phone call ended the life of an international student. A man was riding his bike up the shore of Prestwick Beach in Scotland on the cool and crisp morning of December the 4th, 2005. The fresh air from the seawater made for a relaxing ride when he spotted what looked like a small whale washed up on the shore. When he approached, to his horror, it turned out to be the body of a woman lying face down, her bag washed up beside her, belongings intact. The authorities were called and the body was immediately identified as Swedish native Annie Borjesson. Annie Borjesson was a 30-year-old Swedish woman who had a love for Scotland. After vacationing there, she decided to move in to study English. After finishing a scholarship at the Whiskey Heritage Center in Edinburgh, she focused on finding a job in the hospitality industry. Friends and family described her as carefree and positive. Often going out to clubs and partying, an athletic woman, Annie spent her evenings at the Murrayfield Wanderers Rugby Club and liked to go swimming. She enjoyed singing and performing, even participating in a band with her siblings. Her outgoing personality, however, may have been her downfall. According to Annie's best friend, Maria, she met a man named Martin Leslie at a local nightclub called Mood. As a huge fan of rugby, Annie got along with the supposed ex-rugby player. He offered her some champagne, but even though it was declined, the two spoke for a few hours. They began dating for a short time before Annie found out he'd been lying. After the breakup, Annie and Maria were hanging out at the swimming club when they bumped into him. Annie looked very uncomfortable after he gave her a glare, mentioning that she was uneasy now that she knew he lied about his identity. The true identity of Martin was never revealed. On December 3rd, 2005, Annie was set to go back home for Christmas. She was packed and ready to go, having finished up her affairs in Scotland for the year. Around 2.15 p.m., her Swedish credit card company reported two failed attempts at withdrawing money due to insufficient funds, one for $100 and the other for 50. Only an hour later, CCTV footage showed Annie at the airport 35 miles away. She spent three minutes in the airport parking lot before exiting to the walkway, visibly distressed. There was no record at the airport to show whether she was trying to purchase a ticket back home to Gothenburg. Around 3.15, CCTV showed her at the overhead terminal, but she never boarded a flight. At 3.19, she is seen leaving the airport, heading towards the town of Prestwick. And around 4 p.m., she's seen about a mile from the water at Prestwick Beach. The CCTV footage of her actions throughout the day ends there, and she wasn't seen again until the next morning, when her lifeless body washed up on the beach. Annie's mother, Guye Borjesson, along with several media outlets, believed that Annie's death was not self-inflicted, but in fact a cover-up for something bigger. Suspicions began when the Swedish minister asked for the case to be looked over again, only to be refused by Scottish authorities. Guyen noticed inconsistencies in the autopsy report from Scotland after Annie's body was returned. The undertaker at the funeral home in Sweden was surprised at palm-sized bruises that covered the body's right arm, sides, and right behind the ear. Annie's beautiful waist-length blonde hair that she was so proud of had been chopped short, almost as if forcibly pulled from her scalp. The Crown Office in Scotland told Guyet the funeral staff cut Annie's hair so her family wouldn't need to see it all matted in mud and debris from the sea. But the undertaker in Sweden was skeptical. Documents relating to Annie's death are deemed classified and both the Swedish and Scottish governments refused to provide any death records to the family, who turned to the medical professionals. In June 2019, British forensic pathologist Dr. Stuart Hamilton reviewed the autopsy reports. There were no mentions of drowning, nor the bruising in the reports. Dr. Hamilton explained that it wasn't possible for a body to be bruised after death, so it was unlikely that the trauma was due to rocks and objects at sea. 
A specialist in Stratford performed a test on the blood in Annie's bone marrow, showing that freshwater algae cells were found rather than marine algae, not something that would make sense for a person drowned at sea, although the freshwater algae could have just been from drinking tap water. The Swedish authority for forensic medicine refused further investigation on Annie's lungs. Annie's hand had traces of DNA from an unknown woman, which could have easily been from touching something as simple as a stair railing or another lead, something the Crown Office wouldn't look into. A concerned man named Andrew Montgomery reported seeing a person who looked very similar to Annie from afar on the beach, very close to the water. The man believed the person was contemplating hurting themselves and made his report after the area was taped off the next morning. But CCTV footage showed Annie at the airport at the same time, so this was ruled out by authorities. Kenneth Roy from the Scottish Review was a key investigator in the case, but he passed away before he was able to finish his investigation. In his research, he found that Annie didn't go home the night before her flight but instead went to a party in Edinburgh around 10 p.m. Nobody knew what happened at the party or if she even returned home that night. Kenneth believed it was possible she might have arranged to meet someone from the party at the airport. Guyer highly disagrees that Annie would take her own life. What strong swimmer would choose a watery grave? Annie had always been a bubbly girl and had plans to look forward to after getting back home. She made a hair appointment the day before her flight and planned on going Christmas shopping with friends. On Annie's person, Swedish library books were found. She had also paid the following month's rent to her flat in Edinburgh. Gouillet was also concerned that her daughter's journal was missing. She never left the house without it. She kept extra money, her contacts, little poems and phrases she enjoyed. Annie's last words to her mother was to say that she had to take care of something and make a decision that might change her life. The red fleece she was seen wearing in the CCTV footage was never found. Even though Annie's belongings were washed up with her, those were the items that were supposedly lost at sea. Guyev further investigated her daughter's death, traveling to Scotland to the very beach her daughter was found on. After speaking with locals, she learned it wouldn't be possible for the tide to carry the body to that spot. However, a marine expert who spoke with Sky News revealed that Presswick did experience a higher tide than usual that weekend. The theory Gouillet believes the most was a CIA cover-up. Around the time Annie died, a reporter named Christina Boriasson published an acclaimed book accusing the United States government of misdeeds, such as transporting political criminals through Prestwick Airport. Because Annie's middle name was Christina, and she was passing through the same day the book was published, and seven days later, Annie was found dead. These facts raised red flags for the distraught mother. Annie's emails were also wiped clean, as well as her telephone records. Her family and friends reported getting in contact with her over the phone, but even missed calls weren't recorded. No matter the cause, Annie's death has had long-term effects on her family. Her father has suffered from two strokes, and her mother still hasn't come to terms with losing her daughter. I can't say that I think about her every day, because I think about her every minute. She's always on my mind. Gouillet said in an interview with Scottish Daily Mail. Her mother visits Annie's grave, decorating a tableau by her headstone in elaborate displays each season. Gouillet remembers she was very brave and not easily scared. She could handle any situation, and she did, except for this very last one. <laughs>